Right, I've got a short period of time to attempt to melt your minds with data, um, so uh, I hope you'll enjoy the ride. This is what I'm going to talk about, so there's lots of stuff. Um, so, code base, the big, horrendously ugly, brutalist building next door to the castle. Um, we took that on, quarter of a million square feet. The people used to sign on in the dole in the pit bit where we're now building these uh, young technology companies. So, started it in uh, 2014. Uh, since then, we're now the largest in the UK. We've grown six times in three years. We now have 98 companies within the, the, the building. We've created 660 net new jobs, and the companies that we've incubated have raised just over half a billion dollars in, in capital to, to build those, those companies. So, um, not too bad. Um, and we've the difference between us is that we actually build companies, so we, f we structure those businesses uh, and, and grow them appropriately, uh, which I'll get on to. Okay. The stuff we know already. That the world is changing dramatically. And as we would say, software is eating the world. I don't care about sectors anymore in the traditional sense. Uh, digital or software is the key to growth of all sectors, bar none. It's the core of everything. Um, and we are utterly aware of this. Uh, we used to think that was a lot of people on the internet back in 1995. And of course now we've got to the position where nearly every adult human being on earth has access to the internet. Admittedly, a whole bunch of those people in the third world are using um, feature phones, not smartphones. It's your old Nokia that they're using but, uh, with text-based internet, but nonetheless access to the internet. And that means that technology used to be sold normally to like, rich white guys, uh, but now technology is for everyone and that changes absolutely everything. It changes the market, it changes the access to secular information, it changes everything. Right, forgive this slide, but it's amazing, right? So <laughs> allow me to walk you through it. So this is about adoption of technology. So starting in the bottom in 1900 up until today, and on this axis, we've got when we can consider a technology to be adopted. So we'll say about when a technology, about 9% of, of the population have it, we'll say it's kind of starting to be a thing. And we, we cut it off, not at 100%, but at 91%, because there's always some nut jobs up in a bothy <laughs> who don't get electricity, okay? And, and so this is a really good way to think about uh, the adoption of new technologies. So if you look at the green line here, at 1904, real, with electricity, and you can take the same with the phone and, and the car and so on. But if you follow that line up and you see the depression and the war years and so on, uh, all the way up until 1976. And it's really more than 70 years, actually, for that technology to be fully adopted. So if you think about it, oh, and sorry, see the, uh, the green line along the top? That's life expectancy of, of humans. So you could grow up back then and you could go to school and learn about electricity. And you might be lucky enough to go to college and learn about electricity then, and you could get a job in the electricity industry. And you could go all the way through and you could retire with a nice gold watch. Look at this red line here. This is the smartphone. It's already fully adopted. So if you're going to school and you're learning that touching a piece of glass as a user interface is a thing, you haven't even got to university by the time that Alexa's taken over and it's voice control. So big existential questions, what the hell do you teach your kids in school and so on? But nonetheless, this is where we're, we're living. The important take home measure from that is probably that if there's one thing that we could give our children, it would be the ability to continue to learn because we, we are all going to have to learn again and again and again at faster and faster paces. At the same time, companies are dying off faster. Back in 1960, this is the uh, average lifespan on the S&P 500. The average lifespan was 60 years. Now, it's around about 12 years, the average lifespan of these companies. And as new companies take over and are destroyed themselves, we see this disruption. And this is stuff that may be trite. Many of you have seen this stuff before, but it's worth repeating 
This Airbnb, world's biggest uh, hotel company, owns no hotels. Uber, world's biggest taxi company, owns no taxis. Uh, when's the last time you paid for a long distance phone call? Do you remember Kodak, anyone? <laughs> uh, WhatsApp now sends double the amount of SMS messages than SMS. And this is one of these slides where the, uh, the punchline is on the slide already. If I was more keen on animating, I'd have it pop up later, but I can't be bothered. So, when thinking about companies doing their forward planning, and then if you think about the classic turkey problem. So if you were a turkey and your keystone metric of success was body mass, you'd love the farmer. Because every day, the farmer gives you more food and you get bigger and bigger, your body mass gets bigger, and the farmer's a great guy. So if you were doing your predictions, your financial predictions, or your, in this case, your body mass predictions for next year, in Q1 and Q2, with a really good certainty, a good nice R squared there, but you put some uh, variables around it, but essentially you would have a pretty straight line. But there's a single piece of information that that turkey doesn't know about, and of course, that's Christmas. <laughs> the point of this is that what is the turkey moment for traditional SMEs? I hate the word, we should never use it, but traditional businesses in Scotland. What happens when a company like Zero comes along and becomes the Facebook for accountancy? And it doesn't destroy the top end of what the, what the best accountants may do for you, but it rips out all of the bread and butter stuff by automating it and destroys every local accountancy firm in Scotland. The same for law, etc. And this is what we are dealing with. So the idea that many of these companies have when they're thinking about their growth and next year they might hire another person and maybe they'll open an office in Dundee, the chances of these companies being killed off is, is real and it's something we're facing all the time. So we know that not every country will succeed. And this is a, believe it, I've got a lot of uh, stuff to talk about and it ends up being a very positive message at the end of this talk. So, you know, <laughs> bear with me. <coughs> this is fascinating, okay? So again, this is, on this side, the US stock market. On this side, the British stock market, AIM. 1900 and 2015. So we're saying that in 1900, you could take the railways as a proxy for innovation. So clearly, back then, the UK was highly exposed to this form of technological innovation. Now, this bit here is all of tech on NASDAQ. Can you even see it from where you're sitting? See this tiny sliver here? That's all of tech in the London Stock Exchange. And it's worse because uh, since that happened, ARM have been sold to the Chinese, so that's gone. And that little tiny sliver also includes BT. Now, BT is plumbing. It's nice plumbing, but it's plumbing. So this is a shocking underexposure to the thing that we all are aware is changing our lives completely. Then it gets worse. This is the relative size of those stock markets. So back then, 1899, the UK was a quarter of all stocks and shares sold. Today, and I'll get out of the way, 6.2%. So even that tiny sliver is even smaller. And when I used to go around the world and I was trying to, you know, do my PT Barnum bit for Scottish startups and say how awesome it was to build businesses in Scotland, we'd say, you know, oh, we invented, you know, we like to think we invented everything. It's not true. We just invented nearly everything and all of that stuff. And it's a good thing to talk about. And, and you know, I, I used to do it. But the truth is, when you actually map that out, that's all in the past. In fact, it's a lot when you really map out all of the inventions, they're incredibly clustered a couple of hundred years ago. So we're living on these past glories. So what we've been doing recently? Well, this uh, is the GERS data. And so Scotland spends 325% more money on enterprise and economic development than the rest of the UK for no results. So Scotland, 52 per, per capita, one company created for every 12 people. The rest of the UK, 16 pounds per capita, one company for every 10 people. And you know it's worse than that, because see the UK stats, it's actually difficult to tease apart the Scottish bits, so the Scottish bits included there. So it's staggeringly bad. And what does that mean we get? With all of that, hundreds of millions of pounds wasted on comedy nonsense. 
This is all Scottish companies. The small, the medium and the large. There are 98% of all Scottish businesses are small, 1% medium and 1% large. And we all know that that zero to 49 is a bit of a ruse. There are not 49 employees in these businesses. Almost all of them are zero employees. 76% are zero employee businesses. So when you map that and you take this, this is the same data, but you add on employment and turnover, these small businesses, they're not even paying tax. They're not even paying corporation tax. Most of them will survive in little grants here and there and so on, and, uh, but this is not gonna keep the NHS and the roads happening. When you look at the medium, do you see that the tiny little uh, increase in turnover, that tiny slice at the top between turnover and employment, that's the bit the boss gets in the medium-sized company. And even the 1% that are large businesses, that ratio of turnover to employment tells you instantly that they are not fast growth companies because a uh, fast growth digital business, a scaling digital company, has a much different ratio than that. And we know that competitive advantage goes to nations that focus, uh, not focus on creating companies, but focus on scaling them, growing proper companies. So what Scotland had done more recently is focus on service businesses. Um, so whilst uh, Microsofts and Oracles and so on back, back in the 90s would come here and, and sell their products, we weren't building those products. We would build people that would have service companies to service those, or companies like RBS, essentially service businesses. And those service businesses are linear growth. The companies that we need to build, the companies that we're building in Codebase, are the exponential growth companies, companies that can go from one to a million users online because of this thing called the internet. So, I wanna talk about some of the key trends and the opportunities that we have in terms of thinking about a future of a sustainable Scotland. So thinking about future cities and cities getting bigger, I thought back to when I, was, when I had hair and when I was young and I used to read a 2000 AD comic with this horrific fascist Judge Dredd who lived in, in Mega City One. And that was science fiction. Okay, there's Mega City One and the, the Eastern Seaboard and the Cursed Earth where all obviously nuclear war had happened or whatever. But that's happening. That is now the truth. Successful cities are growing faster and faster than ever before. So today, more than half of the world's population are living in urban areas. By 2050, it'll be 70%. Let's see, power of technology. There we go. There we are. This slide's fascinating. So this is the number of people added to a city per hour. So London has nine people added to it per hour, which is actually a staggering amount when you, you think about it. But look at Bombay, 51, Lagos, 85, Delhi, 79 people an hour moving to these cities. So with scale comes both the good and the bad. With scale comes more crime, but also with scale comes all of the good stuff. So all of the economic development, the laws of scaling are such that you get about a 15% efficiency saving as you scale a city. It's also where all of the innovation happens. These companies exist in clusters where people come together. So technology has given us superpowers which outpace science fiction. Wikipedia, the power to know anything. Google Maps, the power to never be lost. I thought you'd like this. So this is horseless carriage from uh, 1895. Horses carriage, Mr. Joseph Wright, who applied for and was refused permission by the Glasgow Town Council to try the experiment of a horseless carriage on Glasgow streets. And a letter says, in the meantime, I have abandoned the idea and allow me to say that those in authority in our city might as well try to beat back the waves of the sea with a broom as to try to stem the tide of the horseless carriages, which are looming in the distance. They are surely coming and ere long, they will be running in thousands along our streets. And now, of course, we have the looming 
prospect of driverless cars. We know it's happening. And of course, it's easy to predict driverless cars. It's much harder to predict the second and third order effects of that. If you think back to the, the, the last century, it was easy to predict highways, but it was harder to predict the business models of Walmart and McDonald's, which came from highways. The questions that we have to, to face are, when driverless cars happen, what are the second and third order effects? So for example, when, uh, when no one needs to park anymore, does it re-enliven city centers? Uh, do all out-of-town shopping malls die? What happens to all of the spare land that you have? What can we do with that? All of these questions are real and looming rapidly. But really, when we're talking about a lot of this stuff and productivity and all these worries, we have the, our robots eating your job, artificial intelligence. So we have a number of AI companies and code base just now which are staggering in what they can do. Oh, it's a bit dark. Um, this, can you see this side from, this is from The Apartment, uh, Jack Lemmon, amazing movie, 1960s. So, uh, so can you see the desk that he's sitting on there? So the job that he did there, every single bit of his job is now done in a single cell on a single sheet of Excel. So that whole floor is basically one sheet of Excel. The floor below is the next sheet, the floor above is the other sheet, and at some point the boss presses enter. So those jobs are all gone, but they've been replaced by new ones. So the doom and gloom bit is, it's easy to predict the jobs which will go, it's harder to imagine the jobs which will come. If I talk to my granny and say, I've got people employed that are doing search engine optimization, of course, she's got no clue. In terms of machine learning, a couple of points. Many of you, the more scared of flying amongst you, will know that uh, pilots are currently only flying for about seven minutes per flight, and that's dropping by about 20 seconds per year. The rest of it is all uh, machine learning algorithms that are flying your plane. Where you have medical diagnosis more effective than a doctor, the Alpha uh, Go Deep Mind Win, uh, self driving cars are safer than humans. So, bearing in mind this, how do we build a positive future for Scotland when so many of these jobs will go and we're trying to build a new future which can allow cities to grow efficiently so we can make those great companies and allow the countryside to regrow appropriately? Well, we have to build more product companies. To avoid that turkey problem, we cannot be building these service companies that Scotland has just relied on for the past few decades. We need to build more product companies. We need to leap on the energy that came out of Skyscanner and build more of that, not more of the same crap. We need more scale-ups and more companies at the front of the global stage to drive inward investment and job opportunities. The companies that I've got that go well double in size every six or seven months. So the two become four, but the 40 become 80. And that level of growth is extraordinary. We must have that to have a future of jobs here. So we can be an innovative nation again, selling to the world, and we must do that. And bring everyone else along. Uh, thank you, and uh, say hi on Twitter.